and the Council in the Pledge of Allegiance to please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item this evening is under special business, Agenda Bill 6842, King County Enviro Stars Recognition, and uh, Micah Bonkowski from the Office of Sustainability will uh, kick uh, the, uh, that item off. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Um, so first thing today I wanted to do is to introduce Council to the newest member of the Office of Sustainability, and I'm not sure she knew this was coming. So um, Megan Curtis Murphy, uh, who's been with us for a few weeks now. And today I'm here with Laurel Tomchik, uh, the Program Manager for the EnviroStars Program at King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks in the Hazardous Waste Section. Um, we're here to recognize and thank businesses and business leaders that have made an effort to reduce their impact on the environment and their employees through reducing hazardous waste. Laurel created and launched the EnviroStars Business Certification Program almost 20 years ago on Earth Day in 1995. And she's here to help us acknowledge the efforts of a number of local Issaquah business leaders for their hard work. And with that, I'll turn it over to Laurel. Thank you, Micah. Um, so thank you for allowing us to be here today and to, to acknowledge these wonderful business leaders in your community together. Um, I lost a contact just recently, so I'm going to pop my glasses on. EnviroStars is a service of the local hazardous waste management program in King County and the city of Issaquah is a partner agency in the hazardous waste program as represented by the Sound Cities Association. And today we're here to acknowledge the efforts of 14 EnviroStars certified businesses and organizations located in Issaquah for their commitment to environmentally responsible practices. There are about 450 certified businesses King County wide and about 850 across the state of Washington. Businesses are certified based on a range of practices and policies that demonstrate a commitment to being environmentally sustainable and for preventing pollution with a focus on reducing hazardous materials and wastes. And they earn a two to five star rating for their efforts. The program provides assistance and incentives for smaller businesses to help them meet qualification standards. These business leaders are really an asset to the city because not only do they invest in practices that contribute to a thriving business economy, their efforts help to protect public and employee health and preserve the natural resources that people really enjoy as part of the quality of life here in Issaquah. You may have seen the EnviroStar certified logo on the windows of these local businesses or on bus signs moving throughout the city. We encourage the public to look for the logo and to um, choose where they take their business based on seeing that logo in the businesses. Because who you do your business with today makes a difference tomorrow. A complete directory listing certified businesses from car repair to veterinary clinics is available at envirostars.org if you want to see where else there are certified businesses. And I'd like to just take a quick moment to mention some of the examples of what these businesses are doing in their operations. So to start out with, Natural Dental Health Associates, they um, practice mercury-free dentistry. Instead of traditional x-ray chemistry, they use digital radiography. And they pride themselves in being a mercury-free, latex-free, nickel-free, fluoride-free, and fragrance-free clinic using the least toxic and least invasive treatments available. We also are recognizing Swedish Medical Center's Issaquah Campus and the Grounds Department, which is using uh, techniques which focus on sustainable practices and least toxic products in their landscaping. As a medical center, they are walking the talk by including health outside of their facilities as well as on the inside, using natural organic landscaping practices which helps to protect patients, visitors, and staff, as well as the environment. And then I'd also like to mention um, Siemens Medical Center and their ultrasound division. Their, their ultrasound division's equipment meets European requirements to restrict hazardous substances. 
They have eliminated large acid etching tanks, removed indoor nitrogen tanks, installed multiple recirculating coolant tanks, and are composting coffee grounds and kitchen waste uh, to the tune of reducing about 40% of their solid waste. We do have a number of business representatives that are here today to be honored. Um, and I'm going to read the entire list of Issaquah Certified EnviroStars businesses. Um, and if you are here, you can stand up and we'll uh, provide you a certificate from the mayor and the council. So I'll just go in alphabetical order here. Auto Works of Issaquah, Eastside Pediatric Dental Group, Hendricus Group, Highlands Dentistry, Issaquah Dental Arts, Issaquah Endodontics, Midas Auto Service Experts, Modern Family Dentistry of Issaquah, Natural Dental Health Associates. We have Dr. Jessica Sapoff and her team. You can go ahead and stand. Go ahead and stand and we'll get the certificate in just a moment. And Santiago Dental Wellness. Dr. Michael Scholes, DMD, Siemens Medical Solutions Ultrasound Division, and we have Sarah Anarino, their Environmental Health and Safety Program Manager here, Swedish Medical Center, Issaquah Campus Grounds Department, and we have Rayburn Lewis, Chief Executive, and Liesl Zappler, Landscape Coordinator, and the Washington State Parks Maintenance Shop. So congratulations to all of you, Mayor. Natural yes. Dental Health Associates. Yes. Thank you very, very much what you do for not only our environment, but our city. I appreciate the extra effort that you put into this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Siemens Medical Solutions, Sarah. Thank you very, very much for all that Siemens does for not only our community, but for the environment. And Lisa and Raven, thank you very, very much for all that you do for our community and for the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for your time. So that really is a very upbeat way to start uh, a, a city council meeting on a, a beautiful, warm, hot, muggy day here in Issaquah this evening. Uh, so now moving to uh, audience comments. Uh, 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 citizens' comments are an important part of the public process. We take them seriously and factor them into the decisions that we make. Anyone from the public who wishes to comment will have the opportunity to do so. When recognized, please come to the lectern and speak into the microphone. State your name, address, and your relationship to the city. Uh, limit comments to five minutes. And if you have written comments, please submit those to the city clerk. Personal attacks, obscene language, derogatory remarks, and disruptive behavior will not be permitted. If a speaker is out of order, the mayor will direct the speaker to return to his or her seat. If the speaker does not comply, the mayor will ask him or her to leave the council chambers. Again, citizens' comments, written and verbal, are an important aspect of the public process. We take those comments seriously, and we thank members of the public for taking the time to address us during our meetings. And with that, I would ask if anyone has signed up to speak. There are none. Thank you. Uh, no one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone in the audience desiring to speak this evening? Anyone desiring to speak? Third and final call. Anyone desiring to speak? Seeing no one, then audience comments are closed. 
and we will now move to committee and regional reports. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Council Member Milligan. Thank you, Mayor. I have no report tonight. And City Council Member Polly. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of small things to report back on. Um, the Chamber of Commerce did not have a board meeting last week or last month because of a conflict with their wine and chocolate and jazz festival, I think. But there is a board meeting coming up that I'll be attending um, on August 28th this month. Uh, the King Conservation District, I wanted to, uh, we had a meeting on Wednesday, July 23rd. I'm sitting on the advisory committee. Um, the full program of proposed work for 2015 was submitted to King County on August 1st, and it includes a rate increase that we have, I have brought some information back here a couple times to council on. Um, today I sent you uh, the package that King County received, and um, I do have one uh, policy question. I'd like to get a little bit of quick feedback from you tonight if I can. Uh, I'll get to that um, near the end. Um, during their meeting, um, oh, some of the items that they've been working on in the last few months is they did have a presentation to the Sound Cities Association and there were some cities there that wanted additional information. They provided it, uh, additional information to those cities. They've also held two public meetings, July 14th and 15th, and completed a presentation to the King County Committee of the Whole on July 16th. Um, the Conservation District has attended some council meetings at the request of councils, and that's an available option to us if you're interested as well. And they are planning on going to at least three more cities in the month of August. The next steps this fall for the advisory committee is to start the implementation plan for the program of work and a monitoring plan with benchmarks for performance. The policy question that I, I wanted to bring back and see if there were any comments that you wanted to give tonight or um, pass on to me uh, later on. Our next meeting is in August. I don't have the date yet. There is a proposal, there is a proposal to increase the rate, um, to double the rate from $5 per parcel to $10 per parcel. And you've seen what the program elements are and some of them require some implementation. Seattle is, City of Seattle is suggesting that in year one, the implementation year, if the uh, package is approved by King County and the funds are collected by the King Conservation District. Any funds not spent in that year, um, City of Seattle would like to see them uh, redirected towards the jurisdictional grant program. And that's something that the City of Issaquah and all the other cities partake in, but it's where we make a grant and the city is able to spend it on a project uh, within our own jurisdiction. That's just a proposal that's on the table for year one, the implementation year. I'm just curious to see if anybody had any comments they wanted to share tonight that I could bring back to the August meeting when we sit and talk again. Seeing none. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council Member Martz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I have a couple of things because I was not at the last council meeting. Uh, so in the month of July, the Land and Shore Committee meeting, did, would, was there a report on Land and Shore when, for July? Okay. No. Uh, well then, we met at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, July 8th, and we uh, got an initial uh, peek at the uh, Costco Development Agreement. We had a public lands inventory, which had been a council goal, and then got a uh, DSD update. And then on the 9th, the SCA Public Issues Committee met, and we unanimously well, okay, we had one abstention, but uh, nobody voted against the greenhouse gas uh, emission monitoring uh, packet item, and that went on, and that also uh, got approval out of um, the, uh, why am I blanking now, uh, GMPC <laughs> meeting <laughs> that I attended uh, remotely, as it happens, uh, from Florida. Um, due to the traffic issues, they had the rare GMPC meeting where they actually allowed people to call in, which was nice. Uh, and then there was, in addition, the King County District uh, KCD program of work. We had looked at it in previous months and had gotten additional information, and so we were able to approve a motion uh, uh, in support of that program of work. And we deferred till September a school siting policy item that um, there were some questions about language. If anyone has an interest in school siting issues, please take a look at the packet and let me know your thoughts. That is going to come up next month. And finally, uh, Council Land and Shore will meet on Tuesday, August 12th. We're going to look at Agenda Bill 6780, which is the Costco uh, Development Agreement. 
Uh, we're going to have a conversation about traffic concurrency, as, as has happened at uh, all the committees. And finally, we will take a look at the council, uh, uh, the land and shore work plan going forward. This concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Council Member Scher. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening to members of the viewing public. The Council Infrastructure Committee will meet next on Tuesday, August 26th at 5.30 p.m. in the Pickering Room of City Hall Northwest. The agenda has not yet been set, but the proposed list of items includes a discussion of the potential Costco development agreement, um, hopefully a follow-up on metro transit cuts, which are due to begin in late September, and some committee brainstorming concerning innovative small-scale transportation projects. The full official agenda will be posted on the website uh, at a date preceding the meeting, which again is scheduled for August 26th, not our usual meeting uh, date, uh, but we had to move it due to some schedule conflicts. That concludes my report. Thank you. Council Member Barber. Uh, at, in the Eagle Room. The first item is 6862, uh, the Recreation Scholarship Program, 6866, Human Service Campus Support, 6869, the Sector Analysis Action Funding, 6839, Disaster, Regional Disaster Framework. The next would be 6840, the Hazard Mitigation Plan, and 6846, the Financial Systems Enterprise Resource Planning System. The next would be the update to the 2013-14 City Council goals. And the last item on our agenda is traffic concurrency. Um, so a very long agenda for Thursday. And then just a quick brief update in regards to the tourism plan that the Chamber and the Chamber Steering Committee has been working on with the Roger Brooks Associates. Um, they've been working for about three months now, and the work is almost done. A few final edits yet are coming forward to the document and that final deliverable should be uh, completed by the end of August. Uh, and once that is approved and hopefully uh, accepted, uh, we're looking at a two to three year phase in of this. So it's going to be a long process um, to begin to work towards uh, the many um, interesting things that we've been seeing coming forward from the Roger Brooks in regards to getting some a tourism plan put together for the city of Issaquah. So I think everyone's looking forward to that final report and working towards the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Goodman. No report. And Council President Winterstein. All right, thank you. On Thursday, July 24th, I attended a meeting of the board of the Joint Recommendations Committee. And during that meeting, we approved a federal legislative agenda for 2015. Uh, and we also had discussions about uh, housing finance guidelines and also about the uh, King County Consortium's Consolidated Housing and Community Development Plan and Regional Affordable Housing Program guidelines, which is a, a five-year policy document that we will be updating later this year with participation um, dur of the, during the formation of, of which from uh, some of our city staff members as well. So that... That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, the mayor's report, uh, there will not be an executive session this evening. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, August the 5th, is Issaquah's annual National Night Out celebration. Join us for free food, giveaways, music, and tips on everything from emergency preparedness to home security. The celebration will be held from 5 to 7 p.m. on the steps of City Hall. Following that, you can join us at the Community Center for a free performance on concert, Concerts on the Green. For more information about both of these activities, you can visit our website at issaquahwa, that's issaquahwa.gov backslash police. Our annual Beat the Heat Splash Day is this Wednesday August the 6th, the Water Carnival starts at 1 p.m. Uh, at the Community Center. The fire truck arrives at 2.30 p.m. for the finale. This event is for children's ages 1 to 12, and the cost of admission is $2 per child. 
Throughout the summer, we're looking, uh, we're working on several street and sidewalk improvement projects. As part of these projects, prepare for street and sidewalk closures. Watch for flaggers and signage to direct motorists and pedestrians through the construction zones. For a list of projects and a map of construction areas, please visit our website again at issaquawa.gov. Just a reminder, the deadline to return your ballot in this year's primary election is tomorrow, Tuesday, August the 5th. You can return your completed ballot to the King County Elections Drop Box at Issaquah City Hall, 130 East Sunset Way until 8 p.m. Tuesday. There is now additional and convenient parking available for our Issaquah Farmers Market visitors. A nearby parking structure on the Costco corporate campus is available for visitors to use. The Farmers Market will continue on Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. until August the 11th. And please note that our normal second council meeting for the month of August has been canceled and the next regular council meeting will be on Tuesday, September the 2nd after the Labor Day holiday. And with that, that concludes uh, the mayor's report. Moving now to the consent calendar, have the accounts payable and payroll uh, been reviewed? They have, yes. Thank you, and what is your pleasure on the consent calendar? Council President Winterstein. I move that we approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent calendar as submitted, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that carries unanimously. Uh, moving now to our regular business items. The first item is Agenda Bill 6802, Intent to Proceed with Annexation of Lake Sammamish State Park and Setting Annexation Boundaries. Uh, Trish Honan, Long Range Planning uh, for the staff report. Uh, Trish, welcome this evening. Welcome, we're talking annexation again. It's exciting. <laughs> um, tonight we're um, talking about a different annexation than um, we've talked about in a while. Um, this is um, the Lake Sammamish State Park. Part of the state park is already in the city limits, the Hans Jensen um, Youth Camp and part of the soccer field. Um, but this would be the other five parcels that are um, still in King County. So tonight's goal with this agenda bill is to understand the background of the issue, why is it before you tonight? What's the request from state parks? What's the process to move forward um, in annexation if you should choose that? And what's the proposed zoning and why was it chosen to be the proposed zoning? And then action if you choose to. Um, the background on, um, on the agenda bill before you is that right after the state legislature was done with their business, um, the state park and the city started to talk to each other because there was the threat perhaps that the state next year in their budget discussion might pull the funding for some of the improvements that were going on, the, the bathhouse and the boardwalk, to name the two. And so there was a fear of it took us so long to get the money to do the improvements that we were worried um, because we know that that's a treasure that we have, even though it's not in the city limits, we certainly use it a lot. Um, we didn't want that funding to go away, and so uh, we started working with the state park on um, perhaps if, if they were to, if we could continue our partnership that we've had for so many years um, and come into the city, we would help them um, be sure to keep the money that they've got and to process, help them process their permits um, that they've had in the works for so long. So in March, we received a letter that's in your packet, and you're probably surprised to see that wow it's from march why is this just coming to you all now well that was because the city wanted to be sure that if we did annex the state park that um our um 
the things that we needed would be in place and we wanted to be sure of that. For example, um, police services. We wanted to be sure that the rangers, the park rangers, wouldn't be um, minimized because they would think they had our police to back them up more than they do now. And so we wanted to get some assurances from them on that and some of the development review issues before we presented it to you all because we knew you'd have questions about that. And so uh, the administration started negotiating uh, an interlocal agreement with them. Um, we're very far along now and understand that their intent is to not minimize their park rangers. So, um, so we feel comfortable now bringing this to you all. Um, we, we aren't completely done with the negotiation, but we think we're far enough along that if we entered into the Boundary Review Board's review process, we would be able to wrap up with the state parks interlocal agreement before either it comes out of the Boundary Review or before you would have your public hearing on it. Okay, that's the background. The request is simple. It's the five acres that are left in the county, um, approximately 380 acres. Um, it's zoned residential, four units per acre, interestingly enough. Um, the state park would continue to own and manage the facility. The city would not take it over. The city would not start to manage or operate. We would only be the permitting jurisdiction um, and the regulatory um, um, body. We wouldn't actually take over anything. Um, that seemed, there seemed to be some um, misinformation when they first approached us that they were going to give us the park and that, that's never been the case. The process is um, the 180 days came up in some question. Um, the council has to take action within 180 days of, the of you all seeing the request from state parks to be annexed. So the clock, the 180 day clock would start tonight and then you need to either say yes we would like to move forward with annexation and think about it, or you would say, no, we don't really want to consider it at this time. And so you have 180 days to think about it. Um, if, if you say yes tonight, we would have our notice of intent to annex to the Boundary Review Board by the end of August. Then uh, I've talked to the BRB and they would be able to hold their review in October and have a, a recommendation out by November, mid-November, and the asterisk is there because we don't believe anyone would invoke jurisdiction. Now that I've said that out loud, who knows if I've just jinxed us, but we can't imagine anyone invoking jurisdiction on it, um, but then we've been surprised before. But that's what the asterisk is in there for. Um, it is our hope that the state and the city would approve the um, interlocal agreement before it would come back to you all to hold a public hearing to hear public comment on, on the whole project, the whole process. Um, and then in December or January, whenever it comes out of the BRB, you would take, you would have your public hearing, take public comment, and then sometime after the close of the public hearing, you would make a decision on yes or no to annex, and in that ordinance, you would set the effective date, which we don't know what that would be yet. That would be up to some negotiation, and um, we haven't, we haven't gotten that far yet. As I said, the proposed zoning is residential four. Uh, we would zone it, we're proposing to zone it community facilities slash facilities. That zone um, we use in the existing city for publicly owned, for public use. And that specific zone is for uses that have a lot of traffic, that could have a lot of noise, a lot of, um, a lot of activity. Um, some people have said, oh, there's so many critical areas in the park, wouldn't we want to zone either some of it to protect those areas or to recognize that there's something different going on, you know, with the beach? And we would just use our critical area ordinance for that. Um, there aren't any areas in the city that are zoned wetland or zoned, unless you actually set it apart as a um, native growth protection easement or something like that. And the, um, one of the reasons that the state park, when we talked about the zone, is they have that um, 2004 advisory committee report on what the future is for the park, and they wanted to make sure that they were a zone that they would be able to do all those things. So that was another reason why that, that zone was picked. Um, this is a picture of the five um, parcels. Little 
There's a tiny little corner that's the fifth over there. And again, the next steps are, are what we've talked about. Um, if you choose to send it to committee because there's just some things you want to talk about and you, you, you need more time, um, there's no deadline, you know, it's the, um, to get it in a certain time. Um, we'd like to get moving if you choose to get moving before all those crazy things happen and, you know, with budget and all the things you guys do at the end of the year. We'd love to be, have BRB working on this while you're working on those other things that you do at the end of the year. Totally up to you, though. Um, are there questions? Are Tried there to make questions? this really short and sweet. Council Member Milligan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Trish. Mm -hmm. uh, just to help me understand better the zoning, uh, mm -hmm. what are our other parks zoned as? Um, some of them, there's three um, community facilities zone. They all have to be publicly owned for public purpose. Schools are zoned that as well. Anything that's publicly owned for public purpose. For example, I think, um, trying to squint at the map behind. Um, the really active ones are um, often facilities because they've either got buildings on them, they've got ball fields. Some of them are recreation if they're only um, recreation, like the, this building is uh, facilities and the city hall is facil facilities. Um, it just depends how much traffic and how busy and um, structures that are on them. Um, so they can range, you know, between all three. We have some that are zoned open space, like the, the south end of Talus is, um, I believe, open space because it, and Park Point is now open space because, you know, obviously there's not going to be any structures. There's no roadways, you know, that are going to cause a big traffic tie-up. Uh, following up, if I may. Uh, so w what is uh, Central Park zoned? <clears throat> ah, Urban Village. Very, hold uh, apples and oranges. The park itself is different. Because it, the whole area. thing is, yeah, the whole thing is oh. just zoned Urban Village. Somebody else help me with this. Cause it just seems, I'm just kind of drilling down to this because to have something that seems like a facility that is... Um, opening doors to perhaps different kinds of uses than park uses. I just don't know enough about it. If somebody else can help me with this, that'd be great. Right, and, and if, um, I'm not, comp I don't know all of what's in the 2004 advisory committee recommendations that um, there, the, there was a lot of public outreach and they ended up getting financing for just the first um, piece, which is the, the bathhouse and the boardwalk. Um, I'm not sure what other pieces are in that. I know they're working with um, economic development on um, different R, um, requests for proposals for, um, you know, maybe a restaurant or some other, you know, the soccer facility expansion. And I don't know if any have gotten chosen yet or funded yet, but I know that um, they're hoping that, yeah. that there's a wide net of, um, that could ha that we'd be able to permit Certainly, we still have to do the critical areas review, and um, it would be reviewed by, you know, whatever board and commission. Um, so there's safety valves there. Council Member Winterstein. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trish. Um, I'm going to ask about the existing zoning. You put up there R4. Yeah. So a quick search shows that that is R4 in the King County zoning is residential four dwelling units, units per, per acre. acre. Brilliant, isn't it? So all five parcels currently have that? Yeah. As was Hans Jensen when we annexed it. It took us a while, too, before we could um, ask the state park if, they, if we could change it to community facilities because they always wanted their option open to sell the land, to sell any of their land. And so... Um, we have always been uncomfortable with a residential zone on any of their their land, but of course we have to get their approval before we can before we could rezone it. For for example, for Hans Jensen. Okay, and um, I think the way the ordinance is written tonight, um, and this is more a procedural question. Um, I mean, this is this is written as this would be the our formal, kind of like that pre-zoning, like right. we did with the Klahani. This right. is 
what we're submitting. Right. I remember, if I remember, did we do that whole public hearing on zoning prior to or following the BRB review? With Klahani, it was a little different. You had to hold two public hearings because you were zoning it different than our um, land use code would do comparable zoning because we had some issues with how, again, how King County was categorizing some of the zones in Klahani and we wanted them to be a little tighter because we, it was already more dense than a lot of the areas in the city and we didn't want it to, to be able to be redeveloped even more dense. And so there's a different process through the RCWs that you can have two different public hearings and actually change the zoning from what's consistent. Right, okay, back up. Right now in the, our IMC, we have a provision that says if we annex something straight in without the public hearings for changes, there's a list of what the comparable zoning would be. We did that on the middle school that you just annexed. We did that on McCary Woods because those were pretty straightforward. On Klahani, we chose not to, same with North Issaquah, because we weren't comfortable with county zoning and we didn't want to replicate it with our own that was comparable. So we went through two public hearings, which the RCW, RCW allows us to, and then it comes in as a, as a different zone that we've had public comment and, um, and have thoroughly vetted before we rezone it that, when we take it in. And this annexation? And this would be just comparable zoning. It's a park now and we would zone it as a park. Okay, so even though community facilities facilities sounds more restrictive than residential four dwelling units per acre. Right. Okay, and then along those same lines, so you mentioned you mentioned something about our critical areas ordinance. Could mm -hmm. you kind of just could you just revisit that for me because I'm thinking in terms of parcels and the zoning and then what that implies what can be done on that parcel, but you right. seem to imply that through our critical areas ordinance that um, uh, further um, restrictions and guidelines for use of the land uh, is is laid upon those areas defined as critical. Could you? Right, right. So let's say they come in with, um, you know, the restaurant proposal, and I have no idea if that's even in the works yet, but let's say they want to put it you know, right in the middle of the stream, the beach, the something or another. When we're reviewing it, we would look at the critical areas that you really can't build on the beach, and we would say, no, you'd have to be back a certain, you know, distance because of our shoreline regulations and our critical areas. Even though the zoning is one thing, the actual regulations would kick in when we're reviewing the permit. Okay, and um, in our regulations, so we recently updated our shoreline master program, yeah. and our... Um, I think going forward, um, a little bit more information that shows how our, our critical areas ordinance and the shoreline master program, what type of uh, constraints. Yeah, I, I like the maps that are in the agenda bill now. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's very helpful. But I think having a visual uh, on where those, the critical area ordinance and the shoreline master program, if I said that right, are um, what other restrictions that they put on there put on this land. And another question I had is regarding the timing. So um, so with this agenda bill, we're seeing that letter for the first time? Yes, you are. So the 180-day clock starts as of? Today, or, when, or when Friday when you saw. When we received the saw. packet or whatever. Right, that's what we were told. Okay, okay. Okay, so I, I really appreciate that clarification. It wasn't um, that wasn't wasn't clear to me um, uh, because I would expect an annexation, especially if something that has like this that's been aligned with, you know, uh, a council goal and interests and activities that council and the community has taken in Lake Sammamish State Park and in that area that instead of like one presentation to the full council and not going through committee, I thought, oh, you know, maybe there's must be something here that might require committee discussion. But I've reviewed this very closely and and um, really the zoning and the critical areas uh, were have been, are really my only concerns at this point. Um, um, I like the fact that all property owners there are gonna have, you know, we're, we're saying they would assume our bonded indebtedness and, <laughs> I think that's fair to our existing citizens. I mean, I don't know that I need to, dis you know, we need further discussion there. I mean, that part of it I agree with. 
So um, I'm um, the way this is currently crafted, uh, this agenda bill and a recommend and the way the ordinance is written. Um, at this point, I'm not seeing any reason to do anything different at this stage, which is really a notification to proceed and whether and the one action option I was wondering about, and I'm interested in others, like what about the, um, you know, the pathway that it's taken at this point, and whether or not to just work this at the full committee council level or send it to committee. Now, we don't have an, a motion on the floor right now, but and this is, would be a chance, you know, to consider any alternative motions. But uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Other questions or discussion? Um, I've seen a couple more. Stacey. No. Council Member Scher, followed by Council Member Milligan. Thank you. Um, okay, so maybe there's a few things I'm, I'm confused about. Okay. Um, exhibit A to the bill shows a map which appears to include both the state park and the Hans Jensen property, right? Right. Okay. Then on exhibit B, the vicinity map, which is listed in the bill as the one where the zoning would be changed in section three, it says the proposed zoning designation as depicted on the map attached here to as exhibit B shall be expected to be the comparable zoning of community facilities dash facilities. So when I look at A, it's got Hans Jensen, which you said was already facilities. Right. So we don't need to change that. So then we're talking about changing the rest, essentially the rest, although there's this weird little piece off of Sammamish Road that's Right. not in the black, and I'm not sure I understand that either, right. but we're essentially looking at changing the rest of the entire state park to the CFF zoning designation, which, according to the last pages of the agenda bill, says it's primarily for services or recreation-oriented development that indicates and generates high levels of traffic, and then it gives several examples of some really major, major things um, like museums and conference centers and like really big stuff that I can't imagine seeing in the state park. And granted, those are just examples. But is the way I just described that accurate? I, I have an easy answer for you. The first map was given to us by the state park, and obviously they own all of that. And so the map that they gave us had the whole everything on it. And I knew it would take a long time to ask to get another map from them because they're they're really big and they're very busy. So I included the corrected map is B that has just the area that we would be annexing and just the area that we would be rezoning. Because you're right, the little soccer park um, that's along Sammamish is already in the city, as is the Hans Jensen Park. Okay, so I guess there's two sides to my next question. One side to it is why does the state want us to annex the park? What, what, you know, why? What are they getting out of it? And then I guess the flip side to that is, other than perhaps increased city services, you know, I mean, our police already respond to the park when mm -hmm. there's a major incident like the shooting a few years ago, right. you know, our police showed up. So what do Issaquah residents get out of that? Do they not have to pay the, you know, the state parks fee when they go to the park? Can we Ooh, can we order that? Good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll think about that one. No, the, the reason that they wanted, they approached us is, is partnership. We'd been partnering with them on the advisory committee when we looked at what their future would be like. They wanted us to partner with them in the permitting because they had a difficult time with King County with, through all the permitting that was going on and almost lost their the money from the state and they didn't want to risk that again to for the next project to to not have the permitting go you know smoothly and it's not that they want a deal they just want it to get permitted on a on a reasonable track that they can understand what the timelines are and they can budget it in time and um, and so I think the reason was um, that they could work with us and as a partner would work with us and we talked about as you said the police services we wanted to be sure that although our police service is great that they weren't going to rely too heavily on us by cutting their park rangers so we made sure that they understood that that's what we needed um, and the other piece too there's other parts that they're asking us if you know we can help them with the environmental review of the next phase 
um, similar to what we've done with the urban villages where we do a lot of the SEPA ahead of time so that we know what's out there and we can get the critical areas and the shoreline, our um, codes in place versus the ones that they're working under in King County. So I would say in, in a word, the reason they want to annex is because we're their partner. We've been a partner for so long, but now they want it to be official for the whole park. And, and our public, our constituents, they benefit because... I think it would be, it'll uh, be a better run park under our jurisdiction. I think we've got some regulations that are a little different than with King County. I think just the, as you mentioned, the police services that were the backup, I think we can work with them closer on that kind of thing. They've talked about lifeguards, maybe want, having us provide, you know, they'd have to pay us to do some kind of contracting, but maybe getting lifeguards out there, which would really be great to anybody that has kids out there. Um, so they, they brought up a couple of things that they ha would like to explore with us in the interlocal agreement that they haven't been able to even get on the table with King County. So I think okay. we're just looking at a much tighter um, partnership with the. So two brief other questions. So mm -hmm. when you say better run, you mean literally the city would be running the park or you no, just no, mean no. the operation? Just that the, because they would have us as, you know, to sort of bounce things off of to help with things, you know, like the, okay. like lifeguarding. If, if they could contract with us for lifeguards from the community center or if they could, you know, get some help with us from, with police services, maybe there's a better way that their rangers can get used so they don't have such issues with, you know, the sheriff's department and, you know, that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever. So I think they're just looking forward to being able to work with us closer on some of the decisions that they make. And, and lastly, Paul brought up the, the indebtedness and, and maybe it's a non-issue. Well, I, I don't you know. Brought it up again. You know, section we two says all property shall assume its proportionate share of the city's indebtedness. Well, if, if the property owner is the state of Washington, do they become in essence a, a, a taxpayer with respect to our bonds no this came up too with the school district um, because we did this with the middle school and it's if they sell the land that right now they don't pay us taxes but if they should ever sell the land to a property owner heaven forbid then the property owner would have to start paying us would have to assume the bonded indebtedness so that's a, a safeguard that we put in for the city that if it should change hands that um, we didn't lose the chance to have them um, accept our bonded indebtedness. It, it looks silly now because you think the same with the school. They came back and said, what? We said, just in case you decide you're going to sell that nice big flat property to somebody else, we want to be sure that that we still get the, the benefit of it. Okay. No, thank you, Trish. And I'll, I'll think if I have anything else once there's a motion. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Milligan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So back to the zoning. Okay. Uh, and boy, it's so nice to get these other questions, and then you th you give me another little piece of why why is am I, am I concerned here? And uh, and the the concern I have is about community facilities facilities rather than community facilities recreation, for instance. I do I I, I, I trust uh, the things you're saying about the critical areas ordinance mm -hmm. serving us well already using the um, code that's in the books. But if we if we call the whole thing community facilities facilities. Uh, and then they sell it, uh, you know, then what What might happen? So, so soon, I'm, I'm bringing that up. If they sell it to a private entity, we'd have to rezone it immediately. We just sold a parcel to a private landowner, and we have to immediately change the zone because it's not publicly owned for public use. And they have okay. to, it has to start being regulated like a privately owned parcel. So that's what we would do if, we, if it got sold to some other enti private entity. Okay, uh, so I'm just kind of thinking of worst case scenarios, uh, but then also the the genesis of my um, addressing this is that I don't think that the entire community is in favor of changing the park into a mall or a place where there are a bunch of restaurants or something, and I'm wondering how could we satisfy everybody's needs. I wouldn't mind having a restaurant in a park. One of my favorites is in Central Park, and I think it's one of the best restaurants in the country, The what's it called, the Boathouse? God, that place is awesome, and it's right in the park. So that would be neat, but uh, but maybe uh, is there a way to uh, f uh, serve that interest but not rezone the whole park community facilities facilities? Could part of it be community facilities facilities and the rest of it recreation? We could explore that with the state park to see if whatever's in their advisory committee recommendation 
um, if it would still fit within recreation. I know the recreation designation has less buildings that you can have, and I, I haven't looked at the their recommendation, nor have I looked at the um, request for proposals to see where they are on what the next improvement would be either, but we could we could talk to them about it. Okay, I'm just uh, bringing that up for consideration to ask. Right. And then, so cycling back to that, what if they sell? When, if, if it is a property that, say, went and was sold to somebody else, the previous zoning, say, community facilities, facilities, would that set up some kind of expectation different than an expectation that might be set up if it was community facilities recreation? We'd still have to rezone it if it was privately owned. And what would we rezone it to if a private party bought it? I don't know. Okay. It would be it would be a risk on whoever was buying it because it would be up to us to to do the rezone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank Good you. Good question, though. Other questions or comments, Council Member Martz. Um, in the spirit of measure twice and cut once, I feel like there are enough questions about the zone and CFF versus CFR that I would like to see it come to land and shore and have a little bit more time for uh, the administration to present on the, uh, on the relative merits of each of those. And also, uh, if we have public input, we've, had, we've received some public comment on this issue and uh, uh, it's it's not clear to me why CFF is is the right choice at this point. So I'm I would like to suggest that. Um, so I guess should I put that in a motion? Because we don't have a motion. There's no current. Right there's now. not currently a motion on. The yes. So I would like to move to refer Agenda Bill 6802 to the September 9th, 2014 Council Land and Shore Committee for review and recommendation returning to the full council on October 6th, 2014. Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, additional discussion or questions? Council Member Barber. Uh, my question in regards to that is, is since we are on sort of this 180 day, which seems to be a fairly quick timeline, if it wouldn't be better to send it to a, a committee of the whole or our, one of our work study sessions where all of the council members here would be able to hear the same information all at once as opposed to one committee hearing it and the other four members not being involved in the, in the conversations. I would be happy to withdraw my uh, motion and uh, see a substitute motion. Okay. As a seconder, I would concur. So then I would like to make a motion this evening to have this sent to, um, I'm looking at Paul, to work study session, Paul, or to committee of the whole? And well, the Tina is checking. They're checking the schedule. Okay. Does that work? September the 8th. September 8th. So okay. is your work? intent to refer it to the September 8th council work session uh, with a recommendation back? Well, uh, and to bring it back to the full council for action at our second council meeting in September? That would be correct. Thank you, Fred. Second. It has been moved and seconded to refer Agenda Bill 6802 to the September 8th council work session and to bring it back to the full council for action on September the... 15th. Any additional discussion on the motion? All those in Wait, favor? Hold on. hold on, I think there's a question. Where? Oh. <laughs> <Thank I'm, you. laughs> uh, Trish, I'm just curious what, um, I don't remember what your schedule was before, what kind of impact it has on your schedule? Um, we wouldn't get out of, um, um, whoops, we wouldn't get out of BRB until till end of the year if we if we bumped it to because we couldn't apply until October so then we wouldn't have the first their meeting would be maybe sometime in November but they wouldn't make a decision probably until um, January because Lenora said they don't have public hearings they don't try they try not to have meetings in December 
but they have a role. I mean, it's sort of a rolling calendar. It's not like right. you can only submit right in August or right. We would just miss the October meeting and hopefully the November meeting, they would review it and they would have their decision out December, or January, depending on how they, how they do the holidays. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or discussion on the motion before you? All Love those? It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Winterstein. Um, I was comfortable with the committee. I think this is a cut and dry question, actually. Uh, there's, not a little, there's not a lot of different elements to it. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. I would have trusted the land and shore for the zoning, on, the question on zoning. I really think that's the major outstanding one. So um, just, just wanted to share that comment. Would if it going back to committee, would it still stay on this timeline? Uh, if it went to the August 12th meeting, it would. Is that meeting too full, though, with concurrency? No. Actually, no. We're not. We're not that. I. I. I don't think it's a particularly full agenda by council and insurer committee standards. I mean, we have. We have. <laughs> Pretty high standards for what constitutes a I full. didn't want to phrase it that way, but that's kind of what I was thinking is you guys are usually very marathonish when you guys sit down. So if we did it in August and I got it back to you in the beginning of September, there's a little more scooch room to, to have the same schedule. So there is a motion on the floor, uh, and there has been some discussion about modifying the motion that would require an amendment and a, a vote on that amendment uh, before taking final action if that's the desire of the council. Um, since I was the maker of, of the last motion to send it to the full committee or to the uh, full uh, council um, and, and I've been involved with working with parks in this process for a very long time, and I'm excited to see it finally beginning to move forward and actually take um, an opportunity to get it moving forward and, and working with parks. Um, so I uh, am very comfortable to ask for my motion to be pulled back, and, is that the, and then will it just simply go back to the committee, to the uh, infrastructure committee? Land and sure. Land and and, sure. Thank you. And the seconder? Concurs. So, yeah. Yes. So, we, so. <laughs> so, so perhaps I'll restate, refer agenda bill 6802 to the August 12th, 12th uh, Council Land and Shore Committee for review and recommendation returning to the full council on? September the 2nd. September the 2nd. Second. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded. Are there questions or comments? Council Member Milligan. This is so much fun. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm fine with this too. I think that the land insurer is well equipped to handle the questions about the zoning. Uh, the one thing that comes to my mind though is uh, public soliciting public comment and a very tight schedule to get the word out because although that question is simple, it's very important and I think that I don't have a uh, clear reading on the public uh, sentiments and I would like to have the opportunity to hear from them in a timely fashion. So Since that's the land and shore meeting is a public meeting, the public has an opportunity to comment. I would point out that agendas are posted in advance of the meeting. Uh, Council Member Scher. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's cut and dry or not. I, I sense from the discussion this evening that the issue seems to primarily revolve around the facilities designation of the zoning. And I think uh, Nina's points are well taken about whether there's a way to look at portions of the park for certain uses versus other portions of the park. And what, what sort of gave me the pit in the stomach when I looked at Exhibit B was the boundaries encompassing the entirety, virtual entirety of the state park. And that, that didn't sit well with me because I think, as again was pointed out, there is a significant amount of our constituents who do not want to see major development within the park. Again, a restaurant, uh, a community type facility, there are things that the park can certainly accommodate and uh, can, can be managed in a very responsible way. But to open that door to the entirety of the boundaries 
it, it, it really opens a box that can make it subject to whatever wide berth a later council or decision makers want to take with it. And that part just didn't sit very well with me. So I hope the committee level discussion focuses primarily on that issue. There may be other issues as well. And, you know, it'll, I guess, be up to the rest of us who aren't on that committee whether to like the recommendation that comes out of it or not. Thank you. Council Member Winterstein. Uh, thank you. I just want to reiterate that, um, and I, I saw Trish write down a note when I requested that we get the designated critical areas and our ordinance and what the uh, what the limitations on any kind of development uh, within the critical areas including their setbacks and also uh, including the considerations for the shoreline master program um, you know I'm that's I, I share Josh's concern and I'm optimistic that we have an ordinances regarding critical areas on the book that if applied would would protect the natural elements that we're so concerned about that's and I look forward to hearing uh, the results of the Land and Shore Committee meetings discussion. Council Member Marks. I'll make it brief. Uh, just, I, I think in terms of, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but when you're looking at retail marijuana and we saw the, the areas within the city where you could, you know, potentially as a result of the ordinance where you could have retail marijuana and some, some, some of the sort of the what ifs, um, having a similar thing for uh, the state park uh, would be very helpful in, in understanding our options in front of us. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or discussion? Are you now ready to act on the motion to refer Agenda Bill 6802 to the August 12th Land and Shore Committee meeting uh, and to bring that back to the full council on September the 2nd? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that motion carries unanimously. Excellent. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. Moving now to our Final regular business item, agenda bill 6852, 2014 City Vision update plan, uh, staff presentation by our communications manager, Autumn Monahan. Autumn, thank you for coming this evening. Yes, I'm happy we're here in air conditioning tonight. So. <laughs> happy to be here. <laughs> so I'm here tonight to talk about uh, a plan for updating the city's vision. Uh, just as some background, we received a request from council leadership to update both our vision and guiding principles. And that was um, adopted back in 1990, and I just realized it's posted here on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Looking very 1990s, too. So it's been a while since we've done that update. Uh, why to do an update? Uh, this will help us prepare for our future and retaining what works well for our community. It will focus and align our organization, both the council and administration. Uh, and create a foundation for future budget and goal setting uh, decisions. Just a quick recap on definitions on what these things mean. A vision is our preferred future state, so what we'd like to see way in the future, whereas our mission is more current. It's who we are, what we do, and who we serve, and our guiding principles are how we act. Um, the uh, vision and guiding principles from 1990 did not include a mission, but we're proposing including a mission just because that's an important element I think to include in this visioning process. As far as a timeline, um, the priorities we heard from council leadership were um, one, a quick turnaround, and two, minimal cost. So this is a very quick timeline, um, but that's why we're here tonight to talk about it with you guys and see uh, what your reaction is. Um, so we would start in September with a one-day retreat with our senior leadership team, which is composed mostly of uh, department directors in the city. We would then draft a proposed new vision, mission, and guiding principles and then present that to the council in October for referral to committee and or a work session, and uh, hopefully have those adopted by the city council by the end of this year. Uh, as far as your other options, we could also do this process uh, along with the update of our comprehensive plan in both 2014 and 15, but that would be an extended timeline, um, or we uh, would not proceed at this time. So that's, that's the recap of my presentation. It was very short tonight, but really this was a good time to discuss process and what um, you guys are comfortable with. So with that, I'll take any questions. Are there questions or discussion? Council Member Nining. <laughs> Milligan. <laughs> Sorry. Autumn, thank you. Uh, so at the beginning, you said that this uh, staff leadership get together from the departments. And where do they get their initial 
um, guidance on how the vision and mission and such might change at all? So this is, this is truly an update. This is not starting from scratch. Uh, we, we do have a good vision and guiding principles. And this is more of just an update. I think there's some holes we all know. Um, there's been things that have happened and we've grown as a city since 1990, so there's some things we would do to update it. But this wouldn't be a complete overhaul. That would take much more time. Uh, we also are proposing um, spending up to $5,000, mostly for a facilitator to help us through the process, who's experienced in working on, on visioning with local communities. Um, so it would be a, just a one-day retreat with our senior leadership team. Other questions or discussion? Council Member Winterstein. So the current city vision, dated 1990, um, one of the things I see in this proposed approach is a lot of parallel to how it was formed in 1990. That, um, that was, at that time, I've, been, I've learned a really an essential um, an essential step needed to, to uh, for the city leadership at that time, uh, and uh, and it was really initially formed by in in a in sessions with with city leadership, and then came through a pro approval process with the council. So, um, you know, this is paralleling that effort to the best of my knowledge, and um, I also uh, think the idea of it being an update using the basis. Uh, of the 1990 vision as a place to start and to affirm and or modify and to, or to uh, perhaps uh, add to um, is, is an approach that I'm comfortable with. I also feel like this can be, you know, it could be a larger, more complex, more people involved up front. And I think that um, I'm not so sure that there, uh, there would get a better outcome than the process that we have defined here. So I think, uh, Key stakeholders already invested in the long in in the vision for the city, um, uh, more or less um, committing themselves to some time to come up with an updated draft of the proposed changes for council consideration, as outlined in this agenda bill. As I'm comfortable with that approach. Is that a motion? Um, it wasn't a motion, but I don't know if anybody else has any comments. Other comments uh, before? Comment after the motion. <clears throat> Is okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to move to approve the 2040 city, no. city 2014. No. 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 I'd like to, to move to approve the 2014 city vision update plan as presented. Second. And moved and seconded questions or comments. Council Member Goodman. Thank you. You're over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Um, I support this, and um, I want to um, thank you for bringing it forward. So, um, I also proposed um, a vision update a couple of years ago at one of our goal goal setting retreats, and um, for all of the reasons that that Autumn um, brought up tonight in her presentation. Um, you know, I'm not really good at math, as they say, that's why I went to law school. And, uh, but, it, but that's been 24 years. And as Autumn correctly points out, there's been uh, so many changes. And um, I just can't imagine um, any organization not improve, not taking a look at their vision statement um, sooner than every 24 years. I also ag agree with this process. I think we can start with what we have, and I think that um, the, the, the city and with the, the plan presented can um, come up with, you know, some really good proposed changes. I have every confidence that this is the, this is the appropriate process. I don't think we have to do anything any more, any more lengthy, um, and I am fully supportive of this, and again, I thank you for bringing it forward. Council Member Scher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, uh, this was on regular business, so I, get we, I guess we get to give two cents to the, the proposal. Um, you know, I would say that, that a lot of things have happened in the last 24, 25 years, and I would contend that sometimes those things are consistent with our existing city vision, and sometimes they aren't. 
Um, I'd fully agree that the vision statement needs updating. It's high time to take another look at what our guiding principles are for the city and, and move forward in that direction. But one difficulty I'm having with this request is the funding. Now, of course, I wouldn't have objected if this was part of our multi-million dollar budget or had been in the associated 2014 work plan, but it wasn't. This is coming forward as a new item, and I'm finding it hard to prioritize $5,000 for a facilitator when we can't find existing funding for things that are already on the books, existing laws, or council goals uh, that have been adopted until at least 2015. So on one hand, you can view $5,000 as just about 15 cents per resident for this worthwhile exercise. And when viewed in that light, that's a very good investment. On the other hand, imagine how much good a $5,000 expenditure can do for the community in support of actions rather than just words. The other difficulty that I'm having is that I believe this exercise is something that we as a council and with input from the well-educated citizenry we represent can ably accomplish in the scope of our duties without a consultant and for no money at all. The timeline that was shown up here doesn't mention public input on the quote edits and additions. So the question I ask is should our vision for the next 25 years or more be decided in the manner being presented? Will we solicit feedback through our website or social media at no financial cost? Will we ask our neighbors their opinions on our city's future or just hope that they come to us at one of these perhaps two or three opportunities? So in sum, I, I have no malice in my heart towards the completion of a vision update, but I can't authorize writing this check or following this particular process that's been outlined. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Council Member Goodman. So there's a public process in here, isn't that right? And um, as I recall, we just had a goal setting where we um, requested feedback from our, um, from our community about um, the direction we're headed and we received um, an enormous response. Is that something that we could do as part of this, perhaps? It would extend the timeline, that's for sure. It's, I'm sorry? It would extend the timeline. Okay. Yeah. By, hmm. Depends on how extensive you want the public process to be. Okay. So right now, the, the way that public could get involved is, uh, depending on if we refer it to a committee or a work session, we could have more than one. Um, so people could come to meetings, and we can encourage them to do that through all of our communication channels. Mm -hmm. So that could be one way. If you want to do a survey and, and get responses and then tweak the vision after that process, um, it probably would take a month or two, I would say, at the least. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Are you ready to act on the motion? The motion is to approve the 2014 city vision update plan as presented. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. That motion passes six to one with council member Scheer uh, in uh, opposition. That concludes our regular business items for this evening. Moving now to good of the order. Is there anyone uh, this evening who has anything for good of the order? Council Member Milligan. A bundle here. This on? Thank you. Well, I wanted to uh, bring up the obliteride bike ride that's coming through Issaquah on Sunday. And the organizers had encouraged us through an email, but I knew about it already because my husband is writing. And I, I wanted to thank the city for permitting and allowing us to be hosts to the 100 miles ride of this ride. Uh, it's a fundraiser for Fran Fred, Hutchis excuse me, Fred Hutchison's Cancer Research Center. It's a significant fundraising uh, endeavor. Uh, riders can ride 25 miles up to 150 miles, but the 100-mile riders, the classic century, is coming right through Issaquah. Uh, those riders have a minimum of $1,500 to raise for the Fred Hutch uh, before they can even participate in the ride. So it's great for Issaquah to be part of it. I expect the first riders, maybe my husband, I don't know, he doesn't say he's that fast, to be coming through around about 10.30, and there's a rest area at the Issaquah High School. 
but they'll also be all wearing the same jersey, unlike other rides where you have to look for a number. Everybody's going to have an orange shirt on. So if you see somebody, say you're down on East Lake Sammamish or you're somewhere out at Tiger Mountain and somebody with an orange shirt comes driving by, give them a cheer because they could be a cancer survivor or they're mourning the loss of somebody who didn't get the opportunity of this research. In either case, they are all very sincere riders, and I'm really glad to be hosting them. So thank you, City. Thank you very much. Anything else for good of the order? Council Member Share. Thank you. There will be no Eastside Transportation Partnership meeting for the month of August, so don't show up at the <laughs> regular meeting location at 7.30 in the morning. Sleep thank in. Thank you for that uh, good news. Uh, <laughs> any, any other items for good of the order? Council Member yeah, I'm not sure it was mentioned. Um, I believe we've also canceled our August um, Committee of the Whole work session for a week from tonight. I'm not sure that was mentioned earlier. We did mention how two weeks from tonight we don't have a regular council meeting, but we also next Monday on the 11th do not have a work session meeting. Thank you. And is there anything else for good of the order? Seeing none, then uh, we are adjourned at 8. 16.